Buenos días, todos y todas. Good morning, everyone. We will get started. This event is being interpreted into English. I will now give you some instructions in English. Translated to English to join the English, uh, to listen to the English translation, you can click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, and select the, the channel. I'm going to give you a, a few minutes, uh, a bit of time to, to join the channel of your preference. Y el, um, el webinar va a estar the en... webinar will be held in Spanish and we will be recording. We will share the recording with you. We will leave questions to the end of the presentation. To ask a question, please press on the Q&A icon in the lower section of your screen. Let's begin. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ruth Nagaran, and today we will be speaking about the experiences of communal monitoring in the Amazonian community. Next slide, please. I'd like you to see this animation. It's showing the early alerts of deforestation for Forest Watch in the same time frame for two communities in the Peruvian Amazon. I want you to notice in the green highlighted section, the early alerts compared to those in the community on the top part, and you can see the difference. What makes a difference? There's a fewer alerts in the lower community in Cayeru. And what makes a difference is that there is a team working, supporting the monitoring for the community, the communal monitoring in this case. We will now go into the detail of what's happening and what is the impact of this work. My name is Ruth Nagron. I will be moderating this meeting, this session, and we have two star panelists. Wendy Pineda, who is the project coordinator for Rainforest Foundation US, and Plinio Pisango Walinga, who is a policy analyst and capacity building specialist also at Rainforest Foundation US in Peru. This is the agenda for today. We've already welcomed you and given you an introduction. Plinio and Wendy will now present each on the work they are carrying out in the Peruvian Amazon, and then we will have a panel discussion touching also on how you, the public, can get involved and support this work. And then we will close with questions and answers from the audience. Next. This is the goal to share lessons learned uh, for this communal monitoring in Peru to stop deforestation and how we can support this type of work. And the work is carried out utilizing data from Global Forest Watch, which is a platform online that looks to use uh, monitoring, satellite monitoring information easily accessed for free to increase the knowledge and transparency about information on forest landscapes, to mobilize action on behalf of governments and so civil society, 
and to stop deforestation through public policies. Rainforest Foundation. Rainforest Foundation is an organization, a non-for-profit organization. We have been working with RFUS, and it's an organization that works with indigenous communities in Latin America to ensure the territorial rights to their ancestral land and their way of life to deal with the climate crisis in the work that they do is included the territorial monitoring, which is what we will be talking about today. Territory management, land management, policy, advocacy, institutional strengthening, and land titling and legal interventions. With that introduction, I will now invite Wendy and Plinio to present on the work that they have been carrying out in Peru. Please go ahead, Wendy. Good morning. Thank you very much, Ruth, for your introduction. Rainforest Foundation has this mission to strengthen the indigenous people's capabilities to improve the control on their land and implement rights. So here in Peru, we are working within the territories of various indigenous communities, working on strengthening of their own control and monitoring uh, land monitoring systems so that they can recover the control of their own lands, the physical control, and that they can also recover the political control on decisions that affect them. And that they can also recover the intellectual property of information, the control of this uh, in this sense. Our interventions focus mainly on landscapes that are in the borders. These territories are distant from the cities and they mainly suffer from a great gap in technology and services. These communities don't have internet, don't have electricity, which difficult, makes difficult the access of satellite uh, monitoring. Understandable by all of us that in these times, the platforms of satellite information are generating information in real time that is very useful and much needed at the hands of those who, of the guardians of the woods. However, they have no access to this information. Our role then is to transfer this technology to populations of indigenous communities so that they can improve and become more efficient in their monitoring and in their action plans to, for the defense of their territories. In the communities in which we're implementing these programs, the communities have satellite imagery in, in updated times, and they deal with this offline, they manage it offline, but they also have alerts for deforestation that guide the monitoring and allow for them to be on time to develop corrective actions in recent times, also preventative actions that can avoid the loss of forest cover and resources. To date, we have strengthened the monitoring systems of more than 64 native communities out of which half has participated in a study developed by the University of Columbia that determines that in those communities that have technology and information, the reduction of deforestation is significant, is much higher than in those that don't have information and technology. We have also been implementing systems and incentives because we understand that these tasks on behalf of the communities of the indigenous communities and their organization in monitoring are periodical 
and free of cost. So we want for this, with these incentives to be able to facilitate uh, the development of their work in the defense of their woods, which will be to ease the access of information for this early alert of deforestation that can allow corrective actions in the woods. And after various months and years working with this information that the communities and their organizations can also analyze and prevent further and identify deforestation patterns before the territories are accessed. And in this way, strengthen their governance systems to stop these drivers and their territories to be affected. This system has various success stories that will be told by my uh, partner, Plinio. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. As a part of the experiences, success stories implemented uh, transferring technology to the communities, we can mention, and I'll just mention uh, four of the success stories in various communities, in different communities. We also work with indigenous communities in Quechua people, Tikuna people. All of this is born precisely in the Shipio territory around 2017, which is when we started this project of transferring technology. We sat down with them specifically to see what they had, uh, because of course we didn't uh, invent uh, the powder, but we are complementing the activities that already existed in that region for monitoring and control within the communities. One of the success stories is the Shipiwa community in Saposoa, in which they self-denominate the hunters of deforestation. And in an integrated system of early alerts, allowed them through the use of a mobile phone to identify and patrol and identify the alerts. So they organize themselves and they would say, let's go hunt deforestation. Let's go um, and stop it so that we can be freed of this kind of uh, threat. And now the Patranova community, as they have been able to actually control through their governance structures deforestation, we reached 0% uh, of deforestation through their program of transfer. And we have the other experience, which is in the triple border, the Cuna of Buen Jardín, a community surrounded by illegal harvest, a product of this of illegal activity, and they lost a lot of their territory due to this illegal harvesting. They, there was a titling of 3,000 hectares, but the, the development of these activities led to a loss of land and they uh, then organized themselves. They said, let's look after however little we have left. We can now reforest, recover areas. However, they decided to look after however little they have in alliance with monitoring, alerts, uh, satellite imagery. They started uh, partnering with uh, various organizations because in many cases, the authorities uh, said that we don't intervene much in the communities and the territories because we are told that happened uh, across the river, but, but we don't have a specific uh, space, a specific place. But in the case of these communities, they were able to say to the authorities, these are the precise coordinates in which uh, the invasion is carrying, is being held. And in this case, the 
uh, fiscal and they work with their own satellite uh, monitoring system, the engineer himself validated the information that the monitors had uh, put forward and so gave the information uh, that the communities had um, brought forward this is happening in effect and so as a product of this partnership at that time uh, we didn't know about this we finished we intervened we came back but in the afternoon as the communities tell us the drug trafficking lords went to the communities and went to speak and said please we will leave we will not invade your land we will not attack we will not generate deforestation in your territory but please don't bring the authorities and the police again because the intervention was perhaps a 60 policemen tops so the community in this case in this way controlled in this uh, event what was happening and how they were being affecting their uh, production. The other experience, uh, the other success story I'd like to tell you is a community in the Amazon, the Yawa community uh, from Cajocuma. And this community was faced, as you know, in Peru, there was a process of wood washing where false documentation is used to wash wood from other parts to laundry wood. And so that they wouldn't be victims of this, they decided to have their own forest inventory. The company would say that they to whip certain wood from the forest and then they in turn would say, no, there is no such wood in our forest. So to try and identify and control this process of laundering and the wood companies to be sanctioned, they developed their own in forest inventories and that allowed them to hold greater control as Wendy was talking about the intellectual control of the territory and handle their own information be their own reference for their information. And they tell us oh, how wonderful before we had to wait for the engineer to come and carry out the inventory. But now with the tools that we have with the satellite imagery and the uh, early alert of deforestation of the equipment that works almost as a GPS, it has the same error margins. We ourselves can carry out our own forest inventory and uh, be our own engineers in the community. The other experience in conclusion is the Kicho community from the uh, basin called the Tamboriaco. These communities decided to act as a people, as Kichwas, protecting not just their territory, but also an extension of almost 600,000 hectares here in Peru called uh, the Permanent Production Woods. And they started monitoring this region, protecting not just their territories, but also the areas which are administered by the state without uh, giving way to the invasions. Uh, the technology tools, in addition to what was already being carried out in the indigenous communities, contributes to this fight to protect the woods, look after the common house, improve conditions and livelihood of the communities themselves and the indigenous communities. This would be from my part as far as success stories in terms of monitoring, control, and so forth. Thank you so much. And congratulations for such interesting work. After this presentation, we are now going to have a, a discussion. I have prepared a few questions for Wendy or for Plinio, and then we will move on to the questions from the audience. 
it's very interesting and i love to listen to this to these kind of stories to the experience that you have on the field so thank you Plinio and wendy because you reminded us about the context about the limitations and Plinio, thank you so much for sharing some of these successes and the progress you have made and we have already spoken Wendy was speaking about about the fact that it's being measured I mean there was a decrease of 50 percent in the early warnings oh, excuse me I'm receiving a phone call And but thanks to this work of monitoring, the early early warnings decreased uh, in 50% and the deforestation decreased 50%. So it's something that we can actually measure. We can actually see this in our computers. But obviously the impact though, it goes beyond and Plinio just showed this to us about the impact in the communities, but what are the the most relevant impacts? Linia, you were speaking about the success and the experiences, but what's been the most relevant um, elements in the everyday life of, of the communities? I think this has been a question for Plinio, I believe. Yes, thank you. Well, there have, have been several impacts that go from uh, improving the governance in the community when we improve this process of accountability, of customization of information within the communities. One of them, one of these impacts is to improve governance, internal governance in the communities that they can and lead their own uh, processes in terms of regulation. They self-regulate themselves in terms of, you know, the way they use information. Another impact that this has led to is the fact that the communities have been empowered. Communities are empowered nowadays. And as I said, as I mentioned before, they refer to themselves as the technicians and as the engineers of the, of the communities, as well as the president, the members of the Congress, they have their technical advisors. We are the technical advisors of the communities. The impact also that we have seen is the reduction of deforestation inside the territories, the decrease on of illegal activities such as illegal deforestation, the change in the use of the soil that takes place in many of these territories. And also another impact is the articulation, as I mentioned, as Wendy mentioned before, we work in very isolated areas, very remote areas, areas far from authorities that have, uh, you know, the faculty to, to deal with these issues. So the communities with information they have because that information is precise with coordinates with pictures and everything this has improved the relationship with the competent authorities now they have a direct channel with the community with the authorities in order to uh, counteract the impact of the environmental crimes Another impact is the combination of mm, traditional knowledge for control and, and surveillance with all these tools. I mean, it's not that we have a process and this is just, this is the only way to monitor, this is the only way. I mean, no, we, the, this traditional knowledge for control and overseeing are respected. Perhaps Wendy could uh, further complement my answer. Wendy? 
Wendy? Would you wish to elaborate more about this answer? I think your microphone is off. Well, I believe that what Plinio has explained is very, it's very good. I think I have nothing to add. Another question, in this picture, we can see a woman here on the left-hand side. We have seen women such as Betty Rubio. We have seen them come up as expert users of the uh, early, uh, early warnings. You, they use all these mobile devices, but all this happens in an environment that is very dominate, that is dominated by uh, men. So what are the main challenges that you have had in these circumstances? And how have you modified or adapted your work in order to deal, to cope with these kind of situations and contexts? Thank you, Ruth. It's always very exciting for us to speak about uh, gender equality spaces and also forest control, which are, uh, as you said, male dominated spaces. We have had so many challenges in order to improve participation of women, of indigenous women, and that there can also be a better distribution of uh, of the projects for uh, women from the Amazon jungle. We have deepened in the causes and the resources that make it, uh, that make access to indigenous women to the strengthening of capacities, the spaces for decision-making and also in the exercise of actions in terms of the defense of these areas, which, which are spaces that are public spaces and that are dominated by males. In this regard, and I would like to highlight the alliance that we have with the Prevenido Said program, we have been conducting micro diagnosis so that we can listen from the communities themselves, men and women from the communities that we work with. What are the solutions that come from within that are culturally sustainable, that are identified and acknowledged by the community assemblies. And these solutions that come from within, we have turned them into affirmative actions that have a specific budget within the implementation of activities. In this regard, one of the main challenges is this, is that it has to do with the stereotypes of related to gender and we are addressing this by reinforcing the historical role of women in the care of the territory we have to remember that indigenous women from this area have been uh, are the teachers the early uh, um, years of, of little kids and they they teach the kids and they involve kids with all with all the society but also about this norms of coexistence with the forest. So from this, the community assembly, both men and women, we are more willing, I mean, they are more willing to accept and to listen to the voices of women in terms of, uh, in, in topics related to the environment. Another topic that we have identified for a, a participation of women is the the family burden that, that women have inside the communities because they deal, they have, they're responsible for the upbringing of their children, of the home shores. In many cases, they do not have time to take part in the workshop or they cannot be uh, act as monitors. So within these activities, we have a budget to implement a kindergarten so that the kids can be looked after and also dining halls that can guarantee that in these spaces of education and while we strengthen these capacities, everyone in the community, they will not have to worry about going back home or going back to the, yes, to their houses to, uh, to have something to eat. And something that remains a challenge is the inclusion of women in public spaces 
this is very complicated indeed, but we understand that this is the seed for the empowerment of women and their leadership. Now with, with more indigenous women, we, I mean, they are participating as monitors within the program and they have the responsibility of, of informing their assemblies what's happening in the, in the territory. And this leads to more visibility about the roles they play. So we continue to work in the identification of new affirmative actions that will have measurable impact in the benefit of indigenous women. But from the work that we, that we carry out, we know that we will achieve this not only with inclusive language, but also with investment so that we can achieve this inclusion in terms of participation and the distribution of benefits for women from this area. Thank you, Wendy. Very interesting indeed. And I remember you were telling me once that the families organize themselves to patrol this area so that all of this can be very inclusive. And I found that very, very interesting indeed. Well, I have another question. And I think that some questions are starting to come up in the Q&A. Linia was talking about how we have direct access to a government actors who have a faculty to deal with these topics, even uh, drugs. But what happens when, for example, deforestation is caused by members of the community and how has this dynamic changed the internal governance of the communities? What happens when it's so when it's one of them one of them who's responsible for these kind of changes in the forest? Thank you so much, Ruth. That is such a great question. I would like to emphasize on the management plans that involves all the communities and the, manage, and the plan for territorial management is associated to the way the territory is planned based on the needs, on the basic needs of the indigenous peoples. This plan covers, I mean, it goes, it tries to identify what families will open new small farms. And in this plan, gathers all the information of these small farms, these family farms that have been used in previous years. But with the process of natural regeneration, they are suitable for the process of, you know, to, have, to make sure that the soil has the, the, the same nutrients as before, so that we can saw the land, we can um, harvest uh, uh, food to cover the needs of the community. So this, uh, this management, we have to recover the knowledge, the management of this, these family farms so that we can Oh, I forgot the word, sorry. I mean, yes, this interior, uh, interior small family farms for the community themselves. And this is done with the community assemblies where they draw their territory, the, what they call the polygon of the territory. And they identify, they say, well, we're this year we're going to use this area, this month where this year we're going to use. This or area that is already suitable for harvesting. Now, regarding the forestation caused by the members of the communities, well, the communities regulate their own mechanisms for the control among themselves. You know, they impose sanctions. Since they are in power, they have their own means to sanction. For example, if a family, any given family from a community has and it has uh, cut down trees to have a, a family farm. They say that, well, depending on the damage caused by this family, then the assembly will decide whether they sanction or not that um, 
family regard depending on the on the area that has been affected the other mechanism but how they address the situation is i mean all this system generates accountability within the territories and within the communities and very often this has led to the communities themselves to generate their own systems for the replacement of authorities because the authorities themselves are involved in many of the processes well, because they grant permissions for the abuse or they generate deforestation within the, the territory. So they perhaps may, yes, they fire whichever member of the community is responsible for this. As we see in this slide here, in the first picture or in the upper right-hand side, we see a family that is it's measuring this area to, so that they can have new plants, they can reforest, they train themselves so that they can reforest this uh, area. And also they monitor and they keep uh, an inventory about these uh, activities. Thank you, Plinio. Very interesting indeed. So, and I have one last question. We have spoken about the impact, the results of the community monitoring using the data of Global Forest Watch and the action that have been taken, that are taken, and the communities, the empowerment that they have on these territories and the internal controls to control this deforestation. But once they have secured the area, once they have authority over these territories, what is it that they are doing with the territories now? I'm thinking about the sustainability of the long run in terms of monitoring. What actions or where do you think there could be ways to collect to raise the financing in order to continue this and also for their own um, means of existence, their own survival. So what happens after monitoring? What activities are they performing? That is, uh, it's very interesting. It's very important to talk about sustainability and how these systems are maintained. It's also important to mention that these systems have not, were not invented by ourselves. Uh, basically, we're rescuing the systems that were already in operation within the communities and strengthening them with technology. Another important point is to mention that we don't work as an authority or at authority levels. We're just monitors. It's a work with the communal assembly, the analysis of how the patterns and the deforestations uh, take place are carried out collectively together with the assembly of the community. This is information that mainly promotes the decision-making internally. And as this happens, the monitoring system and the empowerment uh, through information becomes a transversal access for the management activities for <clears throat> land management. Some activities, some examples are that the communities are develop developing, as Plinio mentioned, their own um, land management with zoning, where the products are located that they want to take advantage of, uh, what are the problems uh, taking advantage of them. And as an example, the Tikkuna community where the forests were highly affected through uh, by the coke use, they are identifying the areas that were degraded and damaged as, as they were affected with chemicals. And this generates restoration actions and reforestation actions in these areas. Also, technology at the hands of the 
craftsmen of these uh, communities has identified a grave issue. They have a great, cons they consume non uh, wood materials for the design of their crafts that are sold in touristic uh, areas. And they were able to trace where this wood comes from. And they were able to see that, for example, an important species such as Yanchama is no longer there in the Peruvian territories, uh, but is being brought from Colombia. And this promoted that the communities begin to design a relogging, a, a reharvesting of these types of trees for the use of their wood. Also, thinking about technology and learning, these communities are more conscious now of the forest diversity that was lost over time. Before the pandemic, they were carrying out uh, tree exchanges so from various communities. They were asked, oh, do you still have seeds for this type of tree? Yes, well, let me uh, trade you a caoba for two uh, trees that I have in my community. And so this type of exchanges were carried out among neighboring communities, within neighboring communities, to increase the diversity of their own woods, of their own forests. Other communities are also using the same technology uh, as for the deforestation alerts to be able to teach the youth to recover knowledge about their communities, help clean up uh, the, the borders, but also claim land rights in the case of communities that have no titles or acknowledge the habitats that are being managed to request their um, enlargement. Also, there is a important articulation with state authorities that when they see that these communities are strengthening and they no longer work alone, they make up networks that support each other in acknowledging and their role is becoming more institutionalized or acknowledged and other institutions are training them as well so that they can replicate training on tools such as the forest backpack, which teaches how to take advantage of the forest in a legal way. So I think what's important and the lesson learned after various years of experience is that communities are simply tired of registering and reporting what is being lost and they are now utilizing technology to register what they have, which they have to look after or take better care of, and what they want to recover and take advantage of. I think that's uh, well, that's it. Thank you, Wendy. With that, we conclude the round of questions that I had prepared. We will now end this part of the session. I'd like to leave our website for Rest Forest, Rainforest Foundation US, where you can uh, visit, access, uh, subscribe to our newsletters to learn further about this work. And there's also a section of this website where there are as a list of 10 things you can do to save the rainforest. We have 15 minutes and there are various, many, many questions. Thank you so much for your questions. There is an interesting question and we will not have time to answer all of them, unfortunately, but we will do our best. I will ask you to be brief, Plinio and Wendy, please. There is an interesting question here. If you can describe concretely how the monitoring is carried out with the early alerts, which is the base of this work. 
Okay, como las comunidades mayormente no As the communities don't have internet in the majority, what we're doing is installing apps that are near the communities. They, are, they download satellite information and turn it into Android accessible uh, information data so that they can access them through their mobile phones without accessing the internet. By doing this and with the basis of satellite imagery, basically what the monitors have or, or the uh, monitoring committees, committees is as more or less a system to guide them towards the early alert of deforestation. So they go, they document and define whether it's uh, due to anthropic causes or natural causes, and they then decide if they can bring a solution to it through the communal assembly, always if it's a non-authorized deforestation, but if it's due to an external driver, which is dangerous to control by themselves, then it generates an, a report for the authorities to initiate uh, actions and help them take out the threat in the territory. Thank you, Wendy. You also answered another question there, which is once the illegal actions were identified, how the communities respond and how the the expulsion of uh, the, inv the invaders is carried out. Pini also mentioned this in his presentation when he talked about the articulation with the uh, inspectors. I don't know if you want to add anything else, if there's a specific experience you'd like to highlight on this topic of control and coordination with the authorities. I was uh, trying to reactivate my mic, I apologize. Yes, the information produced by the monitors themselves is real information, is field information, and this information is a very useful and very valuable for the intervention of the authorities because it's information that has coordinates that has uh, when the patrolling is carried out they register photographs and coordinates and videos and audios as well they have every mechanism to evidence and to, uh, for an authority to develop their activities and uh, their identification in situ many times the authority needs evidence, they need a, an account. And so the information that they have, which has generation, just generated distrust by the authorities is very useful. Thank you, Plinio. There are a couple of important, interesting questions here. Continuing to talk about severe threats that may exist, how do they protect the lives of the communities and the community members that live precisely in this dangerous context, especially when we talk about drug trafficking? What measures are taken to ensure the protection of the lives of the community members? This uh, is important considering that the threats to the life and health of those who defend the forest and the human rights is increasingly becoming more increased and there's uh, more and more impunity. What is being reinforced from the communities and from the assemblies and indigenous 
organizations is the work through networks, monitoring networks. It's not one person, uh, one man, one woman, one assembly. It's the people. The indigenous community that works together against these mafias and these criminals. The collective work is the one that is generating this type of protection and these defense, internal defense measures. The monitors uh, also work on sustainable activism, avoiding that the monitors are exposed to situations in which uh, there is or there are risks identified. Technology is very, very helpful with the alerts and with the access to imagery that is being financed by the Norway government. Much of this monitoring can be developed and there's no need to expose oneself to identify the driver of deforestation. This is a monitoring that in some cases where there are there is great danger, it can be developed remotely. These community members are also learning, many of them utilizing already technology of uh, drone use. This started in Chipibo's territories where the drone would be sent to locate, take a photo of where the threat was located and with that generate the report to the authorities. And the monitoring, there is, there's no need to expose oneself physically uh, to the criminal activity. It is also important to mention that the process of formulation of uh, reporting to the authorities is, is changing. We have two lessons learned, like the indigenous communities. It's not individuals who carry out this reporting to the authorities, uh, it's the community and the indigenous organization that is actually reporting to the authorities. And so there is no fear of, uh, of, a, uh, of an endangerment of any individual. So it's carried out in, in, in anonymity in Peru. And in addition to working on this anonymous reporting to the authorities, we're also working on integrated uh, reporting. So not a single act, a criminal act is uh, reported, but an actual group of felonies that are being, uh, that are, that are um, taking place in the forest. So there is an actual pattern of the criminality landscape and not isolated uh, reports that are costly to research and to look into. And this doesn't lead to the justice being made with the criminals operating in the communities. Thank you, Wendy. There's another question. As we're talking, we were talking about gender, there is a question here on the reduction of interfamily or domestic violence. Is there an answer? How do you mitigate this issue? How do you deal with it? I know it's a complicated issue. Yes, it's, it's quite difficult and it's important to not to romanticize the work with indigenous communities. So, Unfortunately, it's uh, quite common. From the monitoring work, we deal with it in, in this way. The people who work in the monitoring have to be role models of uh, how they behave, of their character. And when we talk about the protocols of behavior of a monitor, whether it's a male or female, or the, a person who defends the community, it allows us to talk about it in domestic family as well. We've also seen that when women 
in, uh, are, are highly exposed, we may generate a pressure uh, to uh, communal or domestic violence. It's not just males that exercise violence against women. There is also women within the communities themselves that when they see these shifts, these changes in roles, also uh, affect other community member females who are trying to make a change in the community. So we promoted what Ruth mentioned, this practice, this affirmative measure of promoting family monitoring. That was a response of various women and men. So women can participate of the monitoring. So if there is a woman who is a monitor, and her partner wishes to be a part of the monitoring process, he is welcome to the system. We have many families now who do this, men and women working together as they work on their field, on their, on their land, they also work to defend their land. So sometimes we see men and women uh, doing their patrolling together. And in this way, we can mitigate the voices that try to maintain the status quo in which the woman stays at home and doesn't go out into the territory or to, to defend it. Thank you so much. We are almost wrapping up. There are still a few questions that we will unfortunately not have time to answer. Questions on escalating this type of work, questions on possible uh, difficulties with technology, but we don't have time for them. Unfortunately, we will now wrap up for those of you who are participating and listening. We are recording this session and we will be sharing it and the presentation as well in a few days. My colleague Isabella has placed on the chat the website for Rainforest Foundation US where you may learn more about this type of work. Wendy, would you like to share also your email perhaps on the chat for people who have more questions to be able to reach you? and communicate with you. I'm sure there'll be opportunities for further collaboration. With that, Wendy, Plinio, is there any final remarks you'd like to make? I would like to thank this for the space. I am really taken by how many people are interested. Please write to us. I am so sorry I wasn't able to answer every question. We are here to answer your questions, to help you to support the communities to recover the control of their land. This is an important issue and we have to keep working together uh, as an alliance to be able to support them in defending their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy Plinio. Yes, along the same lines, we need to carry on with the support, respecting the use and ways in which the community lives uh, that have been looking after these forests for, for years and years so that they can continue to do this with, with tools, whether they're technological or of any other kind to look after the forest. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work and congratulations. Thanks everyone who has joined us and have taken the time to join us today. It has been a very interesting session. And once again, we thank you. See you next time.